Oh my goodness, man. You look really good. You look Thanks. healthy. And yeah. Right on. All Thanks right. man. Yeah. I'm, you know, just, uh, I don't know, enjoying myself out here in, uh, in Philly and, uh, you know, right on. Yeah. Where, where do you live in Philly? I'm in the Italian market. Wow. I lived at uh, 11th and Tasker for many, many years. So oh, wow. right where that fountain is, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Right on. Wow. Right now, literally, as we speak, Adam Sandler is to my left on the sidewalk shooting a movie about basketball for Netflix. Perfect. I can't tell you how many times we would come home. We would go out to the suburbs to like go to Ikea or something. We would come back. One time they were shooting an episode of Cold Case. And yeah. we came around the corner after we parked the car. And I had Ellie, who is now in college, was in a stroller. And the cop's like, hey, you can't go. And I'm like, uh, can we? We live right there. And he's like, hold on a second. And he looked over and he's like, all right, you can go. But if they start, if they yell action, you got to really book it. I'm like, okay. And so we jumped into our house, man. It's very, very fascinating neighborhood. Very cool. It's fun. Yeah. I love the local, just everything's so local. There's no real chains and, you know. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you don't have to, you know, I had a, I had a hellish commute for all those years, all the way up to WIS, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it was like an hour one way and I was there all the time and it kind of, there were many days when you were a little kid, when you thought the wind was blowing, but it was actually my life sucking because that commute was so horrible. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, what is that? The wind? No, it's insane. But, you know, uh, eventually, you know, the, the wheel of history turned. And now uh, my my uh, wife and I live in Glenside, right outside Philly. So, oh, OK. Yeah. So what are you up to in the Italian market? And, I'm know, doing video uh, freelance okay. and I've been doing that for like a while now. And okay. it was a little quiet during uh, during COVID, but it's picked back up and mostly like right. corporate stuff, um, businesses, branding, things like that. Oh, that's very cool, man. I it, a long time ago before uh, a fairly long time ago, around 1990 or so, uh, I worked at a big sound company that had their office out in Overbrook Park, like right by the train station, by the Overbrook train station. And we used to do a lot of industrials where there would be video people would come to and they would have to patch into our system and it would be corporate things. And we'd literally have to hide in the closet, you know, with the little soundboard and the guy with his little, you know, his little thing, you know, it was a, so I feel you, man. Uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's in, in, a, in a weird way, like if you're freelancing or even if you're working for a company, like it's very much like being a professional musician you know, it's you go from one gig to the next and you get a run of a whole bunch of good ones and then you get a dry spell and you get a whole run and then you get a big thing and then, you you know, and then you go, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know it's very similar with actors and, you know, dancers and, you know, all the people around that, you know, video people, photographers, anyone who has that kind of thing that's that is involved in events. Mm -hmm. And of course, COVID has affected all of us hugely. I've had literally two paying gigs since March. Wow. And, you know, that's a big part of the reason, you know, I, I don't mean to take up your time, but the, the big part of the reason that I have maintained my professional playing over, over all these years is because I, it's really important to me when I walk into that band room or walk into whatever room that the kids see a real pr practitioner of the thing that they're trying to do. You know, as much as I love my math colleagues, they don't math on the weekends, you know. <laughs> so and you know like the art my art guys they all are makers you know they have shows and stuff and they invite the kids to them and it's fantastic you know it's really when, important they can see like look you can do this you know you i have a day job but man i'm i'm busy 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 always so when you when you talk about the similarities you know i, I went to film school at temple and the teachers that had the most impact i don't want to say the most respected but the most impact i think on the students as a whole were the ones that had work res you know recent work to show us and it right. shows, hey, we're doing documentaries, we're doing narrative, we're writing scripts, we're still involved on a on a pretty regularly basis. And and those right. are the ones that you know we look to for advice much more than ones that have been teaching for just teaching for 25 years. And you, they tell you something and you just go, When's the last time you you did a movie? When's the last time you <laughs> saw a movie, man? Are you Yeah, you know? and it, and again, you know, in, in an intro course or maybe a first or second year course, like some of the basic things about how to compose a shot and stuff like that and exposure and all this, you know, of course, anyone can do that, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you get to your second couple of years and you're really looking to the next thing, you really want someone to say, here are the skills you need to be able to do. It's the same thing coming up, you know, in, in music school years ago, like as I got to my second couple of years, like 
it was okay if you missed a class because you had a gig because you were already doing the thing they were teaching you to do. Right. But they were saying things to us like, you know, you have to know hand signals for, for chords. And I'm like, what? I'm like, for chain, or for a key signature. I'm like, what? Yeah, two fingers up, D major, you know, four down, uh, D, uh, A flat, you know, uh, whatever, you know, last yeah. time, head, you know, all these things. Like, what? We were like, oh, my God, hand signals, you know. But that, sure enough, man, the first time I played a gig on the outside that was just, they were calling tunes, and they were like, uh, all the things you are, one, two, ready, go. And, boy, you had to be there, you know. So. Wow preparing you for that just like your guys did yeah so what kind of film stuff did did you did have you made some of your own films and things like that i did a like the closest i've probably come was i did a senior i did a senior thesis uh where i shot it on film it was called we all live life and it was um it was basically like two people who come from completely different uh different spectrums of the world whose lives cross without them ever knowing it oh wow That's so it's the- um it's funny because crash came out i think like like after I graduated and it was very similar. I don't like crash, but it was very right. similar in that, you know, we all live life. It's like people's lives are happening, evolving. And when you mm-hmm. run into someone, when you, when you interact with someone, you don't know everything that's led up to this moment to when you've interacted. And right. it was based on a lot of that and playing with like racial stereotypes and class Uh-oh. structure and, and all uh-huh. that. So okay. Okay. that was like, that's like the most filming I've shot. That's the only time right. I've shot on film. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, so generally you're doing, you know, you're doing video these days, right? For the last, for the last bunch of years, you know, after college, I, I went to, um, I moved to Stanford, Connecticut and I wrote TV for WWE. Oh, wow. Yeah. For about uh, two years for SmackDown is the show there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. uh, I heard of that. Yeah. So I did that for, I did that for a couple of years and that was kind of like my jump into like, I guess, show business. Um, and I went out to LA for like a summer and I just wasn't a West Coast person. I was not happy mm. socially. Just wasn't my, yeah. it wasn't my bag. So I came back to Philadelphia and just started getting on the video videography grind. And um, I've gotten at a lot of different corporate aspects of videography. But um, at this point now for, I guess, really for like the last year or so, just been doing my own stuff, which like you say, like a, like doing a gig, it's kind yeah. of cool that, you know, I, I can look down the road and say, okay, I've got this client and I've got these eight videos that they need done or these 10 videos over the next like four months. And I know what my gut, what my timeline is. I know kind of what my budget is. And so yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. nice, like at this moment to know, okay, I've got these things. I can, I don't have to like prospect. I can talk, you know, try and set things up maybe down the road, get some loose talking, but I know what I'm going to be making over the next little bit. Cause I've got all this set up for the next few months. And it's cool to think like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Cause it's not going. I gotta tell you, I just, whenever I run into the former kids that I used to know when you were a kid and stuff and you're kicking so much ass, I just go, Oh man. All right. Well, you know, and sometimes you can know ahead of time, like that kid's going to kick ass one day. I wonder what, and you never, sometimes you never run into them ever again. You just wonder what happened to them and stuff, Mm -hmm. you know? And then sometimes, you know, we we have the blessing of like being, you know, uh, 25 miles away from each other. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So do you keep in touch with any of the cats you graduated with? Well, now, since I've been doing this podcast, I've been doing this for about a year now. So, you know, pretty much everyone that I do a show with, um, I keep in contact with, you know, on a, on a pretty regular, regular basis. So, cool, man. you know, that, you know, you know, I've already done episodes with Mike, Mike Clyburn and JP and right. Barclay. Um, yeah. And yeah. JP, J- dude, JP is kicking it like yeah. for years now, you know, I reached out to him when he first got that gig and I said, dude, just remember, you know, keeping your musicians happy. You were in the pit one time, you know, what's up. <laughs> and man, he's, I just, I love seeing what he's up to. That's very cool. So yeah. the premise of the show is really catching up with everybody that I didn't have a relationship with, you know, outside of like six people that I really considered friends, everyone right. else, it's kind of getting to know what their perspective was of high school. But the cool thing is when I get to when I get to talk to someone like a JP or Mike Clyburn or Barclay who can talk about, you know, the music program. And it kind of like takes me back because that's not essential. It's not something I I get to revisit much at all. You know, I don't talk to a lot of people from musicals in my everyday life. And so to talk about this, you know, the music program with starting with Mrs. Reckner or Rubenstein when I first met her and Mrs. Reckner and then Mr. Conahan and Mrs. Watson Bay with the musicals in the middle school and then coming to high school and doing all those programs with you guys. It's a world of my life that I'm really unlocking in my thirties that I haven't had a chance to 
dive into for so long until I started making these connections again. Yeah, that's really cool, man. That, that you know, kudos to you for doing that. That's really cool. I have to imagine that those the people that you mentioned, all four of them, were probably really happy to hear from you too. You know, oh, yeah. because yeah. like it was like some days it was the reason they came to school was because we were going to play or we were going to do, you know, we're going to do something musical in some way. Well, dude, this is my, this is year 24. So it's been many, many, many good students, many interesting people. And, you know, I loved every one of them. And I remember probably 98% of them. I really do. And I run into them sometimes and I'm like, Oh, Hey, what's going on? You know, but when did you, when did you come into Wizzahickon? Uh, um, I got hired on July 2nd, 1997. Wow. So that was really our freshman year. I think so. Yeah. I think your freshman year, if you started, wow. if you started in 97, you yeah. know, I knew, you know, I was there, of course, being run the marching band for 10 years. I was there in August before anyone else was there. I knew my way around the bottom part of the building before I had ever met anyone other than the principal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I, like I didn't know any other teachers, I didn't know anybody, but I had I knew the building intimately because we had been all over it for all those weeks of band camp and right. clinics and all that stuff. Yeah. Wow. And yes, that was Mr. Anderson's first year as well at the yeah, school. That's right. That's right. And wow. and he I didn't he I was hired before him. So the people that the, the 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 sort of the final step of the interview is I had to go into a room where a bunch of the acting principal and the athletic director and a handful of other people were kind of sitting in a room. And, and uh, these are all old school dudes, you know, old school jocks, every one of them. Right. And I walk in and they're like, Hey, uh, you're, you're uh, trying to be the new band guy. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And like, what's your, uh, and I remember this very distinctly. They go, what, what's your, what's your uh, philosophy of discipline? And I said, uh, mutual respect. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, I respect them for being trying to play their instruments and they need, they need to try to respect me for being a more experienced musician than them. Mm-hmm. And as long as we keep that going, you know, they can make as many mistakes as possible. And occasionally I will too. And they got to forgive me for that. You know what I mean? But like, you know, we, we're in this together and, and it's mutual respect. And they're like, oh, I really like that. And then there's four dudes in the room and one of them goes, we, you know, we hear you're a veteran too. And I'm like, yeah, I, certainly I am. You know, I have some experience and whatever. And they're like, yeah, me too. Marines, Air Force, you know, whatever. All these guys are like, all right, all right, we'll, we'll be in touch. You know, the very next morning, 8.45 AM, the phone rings. It's the personnel director. And we'd like to offer you the position. I'm like, okay. You know, so, you know, it, it was, a. Uh, and then uh, about two weeks later, I hear, oh, uh, they hired this former minor league or uh, baseball player. And I'm like, oh, who's that? And they're like, Bob Anderson. I'm like, oh, did you know he was a- I didn't know that. A, yeah, man, he was a, he was like, I I don't remember if he said that he went into the bigs one time or two times or whatever, but he played triple A. Like he was a good player. Wow. And he was a big guy, like a stocky guy. Like a, I could see him being a power hitter, you know? Exactly. You might dig this story. Uh, in the year 2000, mm-hmm. uh, which you were still there. Still there. Yeah, we graduated 01. Right. Okay. So, so you might remember, uh, I don't know if you were, maybe your pals told you about this, but, um, out of the blue, my wife at the time called and said, Hey, um, there's a hundred and, uh, like $108 round trip tickets to Paris over Thanksgiving. Do you want to go? I'm like Paris, France. She's like, yeah. I'm like, uh, $108 round trip. She's like, yeah. I'm like, um, yeah, it was this newfangled thing, the internet. You remember that, right? <laughs> this is Priceline.com? Right, or something like that. Yeah, some early site. And I said, yeah. She goes, well, that's good because I already got the tickets and we're going for Thanksgiving. So anyway, we go for Thanksgiving. And of course, my first time in Paris and it, it rung me like a bell. I just thought it was the most awesome kind of place to be, the city. There were things, there were little details where I could just tell that they were giving their population credit for being intelligent. For example, the going into the Metro, the doors, the handles were different on one side from the other. And it didn't say push pull. It didn't, you didn't need words. It just had the size and and you figured it out. And I'm like, Oh my God, they're assuming their population has a a brain cell to rub together. I love that. Those little things all the way up to, we went to the opera and, you know, we just had a great time. So I come back 
on that Monday from Thanksgiving weekend. And of course I tell the kids all about it, you know, all your pals and stuff. I'm like, Oh, it was so great. I went to this musical instrument museum. I saw a quartet of, of, of saxophones made by Adolf Sax, you know, blah, 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 Stradivari violin, blah, 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 whatever talking about it. I wouldn't shut up about it for like two or three days. Cause it was such a great experience. And then on Friday of that week, the phone rings in the band room in the band office. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm between class and I run and I pick it up. And it's my friend, Henry, right? Henry is a six foot three, enormous trumpet player that I've been playing with for years and years and years. We played together with the stylistics and Harold Melvin and the blue wow. notes. And we were in this wedding band together and everything, whatever. And of course he has a really deep voice as a hey, brother. Uh, how'd you like to go to Paris? And I was like, ha ha. Very funny. I just, you know, I was just there last weekend and, you know, and I've been telling everybody about it. Very, very funny. He's like, no, I'm serious. Billy Paul is playing three gigs in Paris and he wants our horn section to go and play. And I'm like, you mean Billy Paul, like for me and Mrs. Jones, Billy Paul. He's like, yeah, that one. I'm like, He's like, there's two rehearsals next week and we leave on a Sunday and we'll be gone for a whole week and it's a thousand dollars a gig and it's three gigs and everything's all paid for at hotel. And I was like, ah, <laughs> so of course I start, oh my God, what am I going to do? Right. So I go up to Bob Anderson's office mm -hmm. and he's, he's like, come in. And I'm like, Hey, uh, I've got a really interesting uh, conundrum that maybe you can help me with. And I explained it to him and he's just shaking his head like this. Uh-huh. 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 And then he goes, he goes, so, uh, so what, so what, you're going to be gone for like a week and you're worrying about using up your leave day, you know, your special needs days and stuff. And it's going to use them all up and everything. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I have any, cause I took one cause, uh, cause our pet was sick and whatever. And he's like, you know what, here's all I'm going to say to you. And he starts singing me and Mrs. Jones. He goes, that was my wedding song, man. Of course, just go. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And I was like, really? He's like, don't worry about it. Just go. And wow. they subbed me for free the whole week. Didn't charge my days or anything. He's like, just bring back a story or whatever. And of course, you know, we made a record. You know, they made a live record and the live records out there and everything. And I came back and he's like, how was it? Oh, it was amazing. You know, we had handlers and, you know, oh, one wow. afternoon I was like, you know, I never... I never went out to the Cité de la Musique and whatever. And my Claude, my driver was like, I'll take you. Come on, let's go we jump, jump in the car and we go out there. It was really something, man. Just back to back, just like that. That's and Bob awesome. Anderson like starts singing to me and Mrs. Mrs. Jones. You know? I was just listening to 360, uh, like right before we started or like an hour before we, we linked up. I was listening to 360 degrees. That's like one of my favorite albums. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I love that. Well, well, you know, here's the amazing thing, man. When we did this happened to all three of the gigs, they sold it out. It was a 3000 seat, like kind of theater in the sixth and Aaron Dismont where all the warehouses are. It's an old warehouse. They turned into a club. So 3000 people. Right. And it's mm -hmm. all like young ish French white people. Right. Mm -hmm. Handful of handful of, you know, you know, Africans and whatever, African, African, French, Africans, whatever, right. handful, but only handful. Dude, the deep catalog shit we were doing, like Black Baby and In the Ghetto and all those yes. tunes, they're singing along. Yeah. They're like super fans. It's like, it's like, what's that, what's that comedian that was huge over there? Jerry Lewis, right? Yeah, yeah. Jerry Lewis was kind of funny here, but he was a god over there, you know? And, you know, Billy Paul, we get to the airport and he has security. Walking down the street in Philly, people wouldn't even recognize him. And well, you hear that. Paris, you, know? you hear that a lot about about American culture that in Europe and Asia, um, it, it culture is like huge, and and a lot of bands, pop bands, R and B acts, they they go overseas. The Temptations, right? David Ruffin uh, yeah. went over like to to Europe for like three. I think that was part of like the end was that they wanted to go back over there, but he couldn't get his right. stuff together exactly. to be clean enough after like that first one, but they made so much money. They're like, guys, the bag is just as big here as right. it was in, in the United States in 70, exactly in the 60s right. and seventies. Let's go. And yeah. But I think that was like his downfall was the end. He just couldn't get himself back. Some, yeah. Somewhat. He couldn't, yeah, he couldn't do it. And you know, I kind of lost, I kind of lost touch with those cats because I was on tour with them and the four tops in the summer of 86, the TNT wow. tour, it's like a six month tour. Uh, they had two, you know, it was like a bus and truck tour and they had uh, three um, flatbed uh, trucks and the band was on the middle truck. Yeah. And then the tops were on the left and the temptations were on the right. And we literally had two books in front of us. 
and you know they would play like four tunes at the tops and the lights would go on that one and then right. we flip the book and then we play them and they would do a tune together and whatever it was really something it was doing steps and all that you know so i've seen like a bunch of like battle of the band type of stuff that they did in the 80s uh like yeah. from the apollo where they bring out all the yep. yeah yeah and they'd go yeah. back and forth and hit and then they'd all yep. kind of come together and do each other's songs or they exactly. steal each other's songs yeah and, that's oh, really that. that's really what that tour was about you know and much much respect and love between them they would drink together couple of the cats were into dominoes and they would play dominoes in the truck and school. stuff. Like it was really something, dude, I was 20 years old. I mean, if you looked up smacked ass in the dictionary, it's a picture of me at 20 years old. I'm just like derpy derpy dirt with my horn, you know, Oh, I'm the token little white dude in the band, whatever. But they loved my playing and they were, you know, here we go, you know, to go out and play with them and stuff. And that led to, that led to some other things, you know, like, you know, just, you know, the, the way that it happens in the gig culture is, you know, you play this thing and someone sees you and you meet these people on other tours. And, mm -hmm. and then the next time it's like, Oh, we really need a trombone player. Who's that guy who was with the temptations. Oh, you know, right. it was the, um, um, uh, captain and Tennille, right. We're still oh. traveling around. They're like, Oh, you know, we get that trombone player from, you know, so I played some gigs with them. Oh my God. Um, the spinners. Oh my God. A couple weeks with the spinners, like, they did yeah. this thing with rubber band man with like fake rubber bands and like a, a strobe light. And, Oh, it was amazing. Just, you know, it was really my early twenties, just running around playing gigs with everybody. And meanwhile, you know, uh, 87, 88, 89, I was in the ska reggae band that got signed and we played South by Southwest and all of, I had oh, this wow. whole thing going on, you know, but honestly, if I had kept that going, man, you know, it would be like some of my friends that are my age now that still kind of do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was describing before, man, you know, they have mortgages now and they have kids and stuff. And like, you know, so they so they catch this really good lucrative gig and it runs for like three months and then it's over. And you're like worried for a couple of days and then you get the call. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of didn't want to live like that, you know. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll just get an elementary teaching gig and I'll teach during the day and I'll have my summers where I can go. And that's kind of what I thought was going to happen. But surprise, I get this really good gig at Wissahickon, which takes over my life for a couple of years. But anyway, uh, back to what I said before, it, it has been really important to me because just like that Billy Paul gig happened in the middle of Wiss, a bunch of other things, you know, I played some gigs with Nancy Sinatra back in 20. 2008, nine, somewhere in there, you wow. know, she was playing a bunch of stuff, you know, every once in a while you get called for stuff. Yeah. And you go do the gig and you're like, Hey, you know, run into people, you know, or whatever. So what were your, what were your musical influences growing up? You're kind of like, like you playing all over the map and all that. Like, I love all that. But when yeah. you were a kid, what was, what were your influences? Well, I grew up in North Carolina, right? So I heard a lot of country and bluegrass music uh -huh. when I was growing up, but my mom, uh, was a really good musician. She played piano and organ and she sang and she won the music award and was valedictorian of her high school class. So she oh. was a, my mom was really serious. And so she had all kinds of records. So in, in sort of my zygote days when I was, and I was also, because well, we moved when I was in seventh grade up to, to upstate Pennsylvania okay. and to a really good music program in Williamsport. And during that time, is when I started reading my mom's record collection. For, oh my God, it's a Cannibal Alley record. What's this, mom? She's yeah. like, oh, I had this in college. You know, here you go. Who is this? Ella Fitzgerald? What? She says, oh, she's a singer. You'll like this. Here, you know, whatever. I'm like four, 13, maybe 13, something like that. When I turned 14, uh, right, right before my birthday of turning 15, um, my high school jazz band director said, pulled me aside after rehearsal and said, hey, look, because I was playing bass trombone uh, in that band. And he said, hey, listen, uh, you know, I have a, a professional big band that plays every Monday night at the Elks Club and, and, and our bass trombone player just moved uh, to California and we don't have anybody. Can you help us out? Can you come mm -hmm. and, and read the book and whatever? And I, I was 14, man. I'm like, of course. And so I go on this gig and, you know, it's a big jazz big band gig and it's all these cats that are, you know, in their 50s and 60s to me at the time seemed like older cats. I remember very distinctly that the uh, third player who was sitting next to me had a trombone case that said Penn State class of 1950 on it. And I sort of did the math and I went, dude, you were 21 in 1950. And this was this would have been 
81 or 82, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, so he came up in all of that and it was such an education. Right. But, um, honestly, my first instrument was mandolin when I was really little, I was about eight or nine. And my great grandfather, like put one in my hand and said, you know, cigarette hanging out his mouth, you know, he's like, put your fingers like this here, put it like this here and go like this. I'm all right. You know? And so once a month we would go up and visit them up in Lexington and sit on the porch and it was mostly gospel tunes, but you know, I learned, you know, sort of kind of how to play that a little bit and, you know, and then in uh, junior high, um, you know, in sixth grade in North Carolina, they gave us a test because you had to pass like a test in order to play in the band. Like you couldn't just sign up like you can up here. And they didn't start till sixth grade. There was no starting in fourth grade like we did. Oh, you don't like rent your instrument and like, no, you like no, fourth, none of that, grade. man. It was, it was, yeah. As soon as you start middle school, you can start band. And it was all general music up to then. And I took a test and I passed. Hmm. And she said, Well, what instrument do you want to play? And I didn't know, man. I was like, I'll play trumpet, whatever. So I get up to, to Williamsport and, you know, I, they, they quickly, figure out that I don't belong in the regular classes and they put me in the gifted classes, whatever. And I'm in there with all these kids in the band and they're going out for lessons. I'm like, where are you going? They're like, Oh, we're going out to a lesson or whatever. I'm like, how do you do that? And they're like, you have to play an instrument. Like, oh, I play an instrument. And they're like, Oh, cool. You should talk to Mr. G. So I got on to talk to him. And I go, I go, uh, Hey, Mr. Griffith, uh, all these, all these friends are telling me that, um, that you're, uh, that, that you're looking for players for the band. He's like, yeah, do you play? And I'm like, I do. And he's like, oh, fantastic. What do you play? And I go, I play mandolin. He goes, oh, uh, well, we don't have mandolin in our band. And I'm like, perfect. Here I am. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. It's not that kind of band. I'm like, what do you mean it's not that kind of band? What band doesn't have a mandolin? He's like, no, 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 no. This is a wind band, like trumpets and trombones and stuff like that. And then here it comes, right? The, the, <laughs> My guy, you know, you talk about the the sliding doors, if you've ever seen that movie, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about that moment. So I say to him, this backstage at Roosevelt Junior High School in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, 1978, I go, well, uh, okay, but I still want to play in the band. What do you, what instrument do you need? Because I didn't really, I honestly didn't give a shit. I was right. just like, well, if I can't play mandolin, whatever, I, I would love to get out of class and go, you know, whatever. And he's like, well, we really need trombones. And I went, oh. Okay. And he goes, Oh, we'll get you set up. And that was it. Oh. That was it. And that instrument, my man, has literally taken me. It's made me thousands and thousands of dollars. It's had me meet famous people. It's, you know, taken me all over the world. I once got to play ruffles and flourishes for the vice president of the United States and the United States Capitol when I was in the army band. You know, that instrument, you know, I was in in uh Germany and East Germany with that instrument. Uh, with the youth orchestra in uh, 1989, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we played in East Berlin and like, it has taken me everywhere. And what I say to the students is, you know, you want to travel the world, get good on your instrument. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, in addition to saying the better you play, the more fun it is. And that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might think about it as practice. I never think about it as practice. I think, Ooh, I get to play my instrument. That's a different thing than like, oh, I have to, I have to practice. Right. No, man, you get to practice. You get to play. You get to make good sounds with your instrument, you know? And, and because of that, fateful words to Mr. G, you know, oh, I, yeah, you know, he could have said, oh my God, he could have drummed. And I would have been like, okay, he could have said tuba. He could have said clarinet. And I went, all right, whatever, you know, but it wound up being that. And so it could have been anything. And then, in 2004 or so, my daughter was really little. Mm -hmm. I was kind of losing my mind a little bit down in South Philly. And you remember Mr. Kane at yeah. the middle school? Yeah. yeah. He was playing in a band, cover band. I don't know how to you know the band with Robbie Robertson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the big pink. Yeah, that's right. So he he was in a band that was learning their whole albums. And I went, that's awesome. ooh, that's really nerdy. <laughs> How do I do it? He goes, we need a bass player. I'm like, oh, I play bass all right. And let me get in, you know. So I started playing in that band. And then eventually they became a regular cover band. They started in the Eagles tunes and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't hate the Eagles and stuff, but everyone does that. It was cool when it was, you know, hey, ladies and gentlemen, stage fright. Woohoo! <laughs> you know, whatever. Um but that started me playing, uh, you know, started I, around that same time. You know, I've had this New Orleans brass band 
since 1996 that I, you know, had been a sideman for all these years and writing all these charts and stuff. And mm. I remember I was walking with my first wife down on Penn's Landing and I just said to her, you know, I'm really, I've, I've spent so many years writing charts for everybody else and making these arrangements and stuff. And I really think that I either want to start like a really good R and B like soul funk band or maybe like a new Orleans brass band. And she went, well, what do you have to do to do that? I said, I don't know, write some charts and round some guys up. And she's like, well, why is, you know, she's like, well, you know, it's going to take you away from home or I don't want that. And I'm like, right. oh, all right, whatever. Well, so I decided on that new Orleans brass band. And so I got that started in September of 96 and it's still, uh, it's still going. Hmm. And uh, about two thirds of the tunes are, are my original music and about one third are arrangements and transcriptions that I've done of other things. But, you know, every year we throw down really hard on Mardi Gras this past year, it was two weeks before the shutdown. We had the best Mardi Gras ever. They put us on channel 20, uh, 20 uh, Fox news in the morning to parade around inside the studio on the air to, oh, wow. you know, to, cause we were playing at Chris's jazz cafe that night. Like we have oh, yeah. since 2005, we've been playing there since 2005. Anyway, you know, it was, and then we sold out two seatings. It was like, when I, when I PayPal the dudes, the money, two of them ripped me back and said, I think you got this wrong. I'm like, no man, we made bread on this one. It was amazing. Right. But anyway, that was sort of where that all got started. And I started playing trombone, but around Oh four or so around that same time, we caught a wedding. And the people in the wedding really wanted to hear tunes that weren't kind of New Orleans brass band tunes. They wanted some more wedding-y kind of tunes. And right. at the time, I was playing trombone in this big-time wedding band, so I knew what they wanted. So I said, all right, well, that's going to require a bass player. So I played bass on that gig, and I hired a trombone player to play my part. And I really liked the sound of the bass and the tuba doing two different things. That was very, very cool. And that was it. I said, all right, well, it's, it's going to have an extra player in it now. You know, we're going to have an extra, you know, bass player. So for, since then, we've had, you know, tuba player and a bass player. And I write, you know, so that they're not stepping on each other. But um, since 2004, I've been playing bass about, about half of my gigs are on either upright bass or electric bass. And the other half are on trombone every once in a while, rhythm guitar, you know. So all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. How um it, it struck me when you say that and you talk about like you like the sound of of the the tube and the bass, yeah. How do you pick your pieces for students throughout the you know throughout your years? How do well, you how do you come across those? Well, or decide, it, I guess. Yeah, some of it is repertoire, right? Some of it is you know there there are pieces that really pretty much every you know every cat with a doctorate in a university in wind band conducting would tell you you know, every young musician should come across this piece at some point in there, you know, there's repertoire. Mm. So there's always a repertoire piece on every concert. And there's also always a march on every concert because that's what bands do. And I'm talking about the band in particular. Mm -hmm. um, the selection process is different for jazz band. It's different for the string ensemble. It's different for the orchestra, but for concert band, there's a repertoire piece, there's a march. And then as the years have progressed, there are more and more interesting pieces have been written for uh, wind bands. And so I listen, you know, they send, they used to send CDs. Now they send a link and you just listen to some things and they talk about them and stuff. But really what, what it is, is I have to try a couple things and see where they are. And generally speaking, the guys at WIS are, you know, when they get to me in September, the band is sort of at a three, you know, mm -hmm. a six, is like the Eastman Wind Ensemble. And a okay. one is like a little kid band, right? So they're about a three, a three and a half. And by the time we hit the winter concert, I kind of know where they are. And I have, you know, file cabinets full of music and many, many years of experience. And I go, oh, this piece will be good for them. They can handle this. This one will be a reach. This one will be a little bit easy. And I always make sure there's one right at their level. There's one a little above and there's one a little below. And the little below one is because if you, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know, there's a big difference between a 14 year old and an 18 year old sure. and they're in the same class. Right. So I don't want to give them so much hard stuff that it discourages the freshies and the little kids and stuff. I want to make sure that they have some, a tune that they really like that they can really play and that maybe they lay out when they can't play a lick or whatever on the, on the repertoire piece or whatever 
but by the time they are a senior, they can do it. So usually um, every year um, across about seven or eight tunes, I make sure that a tune that this, that the seniors, that this, this year's seniors played when they were a freshman is on one of the concerts because they recognize it. And then they also can see instantly, oh my God, I'm so much better than mm-hmm. four years ago, you know? So that's kind of how I pick it. I see, uh, you know, repertoire piece, a march, whatever, see where their level is and give it to them. And they usually get to about a four. And sometimes I get to a four and a half or even touch a five, a handful of times I can touch a five. Your class, by the way, is one of the times that we touched a five. We played um, uh, we played uh, Incantation and Dance, which is this uh, really kind of hairy piece. That's a grade five that sometimes district band plays. Mm. Um, and we pretty much pulled it off. I mean, it was a little sketchy here and there, a little out of tune, but I remember that very, I, that's the first time I went, oh, there we go, you know? Um, and every once in a while, I have a group that can do that. Um, but generally it's it's about that level. And, you know, with with jazz band, it's the same thing. I have to see what kind of players I have. If I have, mm. you know, really good lead players that are good leaders, then I can do a little more challenging stuff. Um, with string ensembles, the same thing. There's always a wide range of ability. Mm. With my guitar class, it's a wide range of ability. I have to teach at all those different levels all of the time, you know? Like I have kids that can shred and kids that put it on their lap upside down the first time in the same class, (laughs) you know? Like, so I have to go, oh, you know, whatever. All right, so here, let's learn the strings. And meanwhile, you, you know, here's the uh, Bach two-part inventions. Let's work on this first eight measures. But I don't read that well. You're gonna, here you go. You know what I mean? You, you got to give them the, the food that, that keeps them going. Where did you, uh, you know, when I talked to Barclay, um, she mentioned being influenced by you and going into the service because um, you were such a big impact on her. She said like a father figure. Um, oh, wow. So I didn't know that, that you were in the service. Can you talk about being? Yeah, in the yeah, yeah, man. So, um, so uh, every firstborn in my fam- firstborn person, son in my family has served in the military since the Revolutionary War. My uh, fifth great grandfather, Bentley outlaw fought in the battle of Cowpens, you know, in South Carolina Um, and all the way up through uh, war of 1812 civil war, Spanish American war. My great, great grand, my three greats grandfather was in the Spanish American war. And my great grandfather was in the first world war. My grandfather was in the um, second world war and my biological father was a green beret in Vietnam. So, you know, so it's, it's a long, long tradition. And so I, graduated high school and, you know, went to conservatory, which was, it was a conservatory. Then PCPA became the university of the arts, but back then it was still a conservatory. Went to conservatory because they didn't have marching band and they didn't have frats and all they did was play. And I'm like, that's what I want. So I went through all of that and it took a while to get through because like I mentioned in the middle of college, I missed a whole semester because I was on tour with the temps and the four tops. Right. Mm-hmm. And other tours, it, t- so it took some time to get through my bachelor's degree because I kept having to take leaves to go on these tours. The fall of, you know, summer of 89, I was in Germany. The fall of 89, I was on tour with a big band throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole country, you know, even across the Mississippi and, you know, all the way to wow. Kansas and Nebraska and all over, you know, whatever. Well, it was coming up time to graduate and you know, like I said before, you know, I was doing all that playing, but it wasn't making a whole lot of money and I don't play guitar and I don't sing, you know, I don't do the things that make stars, you know, I'm a sideman and sideman, you know, music back then, late eighties, whatever. I don't know. There was gigs, but it wasn't a lot of gigs. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm ever going to do this now might be the time. So then the Gulf war happens in, um, starts, you know, there's a ramp up to the Gulf War in 1990, the fall of 1990, I was going to be graduating finally in the spring of 91. And so, you know, I start thinking about it, I'm watching it on TV, and you know, that whole thing and whatever. And so I go, I, one afternoon, I just, I told my girlfriend at the time, I'm like, look, I'm going to do this. She's like, oh, don't do this. I go down to the recruiter. And I sit down, start talking to him, and he finds out like, who I am and what I'm about and stuff. And his eyes start going because if they can sign somebody like me with a college degree, they get like $5,000. Oh, wow. Recruiter gets a bonus. Right. So he's like, so when are you going to graduate? I'm like, uh, you know, May of 91, whatever, you know, and he's like, Oh, well, you know, you go in at advanced rank and whatever. And why don't we get you tested? And we'll see. I said, look, I'm not signing up. He goes, he goes, no, 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 just get tested. And let's see. Well, uh, I don't want to say of course, but 
I, I rock the test, right? You know, and then they say, oh, well, let's give you this other test, this, um, uh, what was it called? It had, a, it had a, an acronym. Anyway, it was, a, it was a language aptitude test where you had pictures and then nonsense words, and you had to try and make a story based on the pictures and the nonsense words and your ability to decode, you know, you know a, a word that was all consonants, for example, and it showed up three times and there was three of the same picture. And I'm like, that must be that, you know, whatever. And you kind of, it was like a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. You put it together. And on that test, um, I think a perfect score was 130 and I scored like 125 or 24 or something like that. Wow. And they're like, Oh my God, you know, you could be a linguist. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, Oh, they'd send you to a language school in California and you learn a language and you know, you, you become, you know, an intelligence agent or whatever. And I went, Oh, but really, I want to play in the band. And they're like, oh, okay, we'll get you an audition. So, so anyway, I, I go, go down to Washington and I take the audition with the U.S. Army Field Band, which is one of the special groups, right? And they're like, oh, this, we don't have an opening right now, but you, know, you totally made it and you're in and you'll go to basic training as soon as you graduate. And then you'll go to Little Creek to the music school and you'll be playing in the Army Band. And you know, because you scored so high, you already have a, a Charlie one, a C1 identifier, you know, scored so high in the audition. So you know, you'll go into like either the band in Berlin, one of the ones in Washington or the one in Korea, you know, a special band, whatever. And I said, oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. So about, this is the fall of 1990. Um, sometime around December, like mm -hmm. after the, the big end run by the second ACR and all that happened in Kuwait and all that stuff. At that time, President Bush the first was touting a peace dividend because the Soviet Union had fallen, mm -hmm. you know, in, in November of 89 was when the Berlin Wall came down. And by a year later, like all the other bloc countries, and we didn't need all of these bases. So what was happening was he called it the peace dividend. He was closing army bases all over. Every one of those army bases had a band. All of those band people had to go somewhere. So the slot that was waiting for me in Washington got filled by somebody who was already in, who had a lot of years in. So now the slot went away. And my recruiter called and said, hey, we can't offer you that thing, you know, because the peace dividend, they're closing this base and the band went there and whatever is there any chance you play any other instruments? And I said, yeah, man, I, I can, a band instruments, I can get around on the euphonium. Hey, I, do you have a euphonium? I had to borrow a euphonium. So once again, we drive What's down euphonium? Washington. Euphonium is like a tenor tuba. It's okay. like, a, yeah, it's the same kind of range as a trombone, a bass trombone, maybe with four valves. Okay. But anyway, so I, I get this euphonium and I go down there and I play the addition. I don't do as well, but I still make it in, you know, good enough to make it into the army band, but maybe not the, the, the really great band. So now I'm like, all right, I'm going to get in as a euphonium player. And then once I'm in, I'll switch back over to trombone or whatever. I play, I'll show, I show them how to play jazz, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so long story short, um, that gig goes away. And now it's January of 91. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And he calls me again. He says, look, I have a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Come down. And, you know, at the time I was living at seventh and Earp, which is okay. right right by Wharton between yeah. Wharton and Dickinson, you know, little yeah. tiny street. And the recruiting office was at like broad and Dickinson. Right. So I just walk up there. So I walk up there and I go in. And as soon as I walk in all of the sergeants in there, are like, Hey, there's that guy, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. what? He sits me down. He goes, listen, I took all your scores and I ran them through the computer to see what jobs you qualified for. And he goes, you know, he goes, I've been at this recruiting station for two years. I've never seen this. You literally qualified for every job in the army that's open. And I'm wow. like, what do you mean? He goes, you qualified for everything, man. You, you can take your pick, but it just can't be the band. And I went, but I passed two auditions. He's like, yeah, well, you could wait until an opening comes up, but that might be next fall. That might, it might be a year from now. And I'm like, what am I going to do a year from now? You know, whatever. So I start looking through it and it's like, thing, dude, it's things like nuclear operator and, you know, uh, vet tech and all of these like complicated wow. things where the schools are like, where your training is like a, you know, you sign up for four years, right? But your training is two years of it. Mm -hmm. You're in school learning this skill. And a lot of them were translatable to, you know, like I remember one of them, I, I think it was one of the medical ones. Once you got to, done the training, you had a, you had the most of the coursework done for like a bachelor's degree in something, right? Wow. Like it was really, a, 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 and, and this, of course, this is not like infantry bang, bang, 
or right. artillery or anything like that. These are all specialty jobs. And I see one that says linguist on it. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, do you have any foreign language? I said, I get around in German pretty well. He goes, ah, we don't really need that. But if, he goes, if you knew an Asian language, you know, you would, I said, what do they do? He said, well, you know, if you, if you pick this one, you, you go to the language school forever, how long it takes you to learn that language in an immersion. And then you go to your specialty school and then you go out in the army and you do your job. So I picked this job for linguist and the only, you know, they always say the recruiters lie to you, but the only lie he ever told me was that when you get to California, you can pick your language. And so the whole time, you know, the whole time leading up to that. So I go through that whole spring. I finish my, I graduate on uh, May 18th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could look at my, I have my degrees up so the kids can see them. Right. It's in a, the camera. Um, anyway, um, May 18th. And I leave for basic training on May 23rd and I turn 20 five on the 26th. Wow. So yeah, my birthday at basic training, that was not fun. Anyway. Um, also I was, I was about four or five years older than everybody else. Like there was uh, three or four of three or four of us that had been through college. So we were, uh, four ranks up from everybody else, hmm. and, but not the sergeants of course. And they wore us out. But anyway, the whole time through basic, the whole time through all that stuff, my little week of leave before I go to California, I'm thinking, Oh man, you know, what would be great. Learn Hebrew. And then I could go, you know, to Israel and, you know, be with the UN and stuff and see all that cool history, whatever. Or maybe, you know, maybe Portuguese. Oh, that would be a fun. And I'm like imagining all these languages and stuff. And I'm, and so I, I get out to Cal, you know, fly out to California, my class A's, you know, and I, I get to, to, um, well, today is Friday. So we wear college uh, sweatshirts and t-shirts and I'm actually wearing my DLI sweatshirt. But okay. anyway, I get to the language Institute. And I get signed in with the CQ and she's this nice woman in Karen. And she's like, Oh, you know, come on steps or whatever. I got a room for you. Uh, it's, the guy in the room is from like New York or something. You guys are both from the East coast, you know, you get along and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, and I said, well, uh, when uh, can I just ask? And I've been really wondering about just when do you get to pick your language? And she's like, what are you talking about? And I go, you know, they, they told me I could, I could pick the language that I'm, she's like, no, you can't pick. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it's right there on your, on your oh, orders. No. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, see this long number right here. See that K I'm like, yeah. She goes, that's Korean. And it was like a thunderclap because in a million years, I never thought like, why would I want to learn Korean? Like it's cold there, yeah. you know, like what, why oh. would I learn? Well, it turns out that Korean and Chinese, uh, both kinds of Chinese, Cantonese, Mandarin and Korean. And yeah, I think, maybe like Urdu. I think there's one other one that are category four languages that are the hardest languages to mm. learn for English learners. Spanish is a category one. Uh, and this is the state department rating. English is the only category five language. It's the hardest language for anybody to learn who doesn't speak it. You can imagine, right? Yeah. Anyway, so she's like, oh, you're in the Korean school. I'm like, Korean, what? And, and then I go, well, you know, with this, with this roommate, you know, if he's from New York, you know, as long as I, I just, I hate cigarette smoke. I've been around it my whole life. I never smoked, you know, big secondhand smoker back in the eighties, every gig, every club, mm -hmm. every, everything, you know, my, my first really professional gig when I was 18, 19 playing in a Puerto Rican salsa band in North Philly, like I would come home and have to drop my clothes in the hallway because they smell like smoke. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I said, yeah, I just don't want a smoker and God help me, please not a Mets fan. And no sooner did I say that the door opens up. And it's a dude with a Mets hat and a cigarette in his hand. And I went, are you kidding me? Karen's, she fell down on the floor. She's oh my God, I can't believe you said that. Anyway, he became a really good friend of mine. He now lives in Abington, Doug. Oh, wow. But, mm -hmm. And then my first duty station was the 524 Military Intelligence Battalion in Yongsan, Korea. So I was off to Seoul, Korea for a whole year. Wow. And then, um, you know, I rotated back to the States and I was in, um, in Fort Lewis, Washington, by the way, when I was in California, um, there was a band over at Fort Ord, which was really, you know, just right next to Monterey where I was. Right. And I drove over on a Saturday and I walked in and I said, hey, you know, I'm at the language school, but I, I blew a Charlie One audition about a year ago. But, and they went, you did? What? Oh, yeah. Well, re-audition here. So I re-auditioned. I did it again. I got another Charlie One audition. And meanwhile, now the band commander at the band in Fort Ord is like, oh, we got to get you in this band. You know, we want a player like you, whatever. 
So he, you know, he's an officer. He calls Washington. He's and the army comes back and says, well, how's he doing in Korean school? So they call over to Korean school and they're like, oh, the dude has a 3.8. Wow. And, yeah. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the handler in Washington goes, well, we need a gringo that can speak Korean like a Korean more than we need another trombone player. So no, you know, so wow. he comes back and tells me this. And I tell my platoon sergeant this and my platoon sergeant goes, close the door. And I'm like, all right, big sergeant, close the door. He goes, listen, I'm not going to tell you to fall on your sword, but if you start failing classes, we'll have to reclassify you. And and if we reclassify you, you know, we're supposed to send you to wherever they need it. But if you have a special skill, we can put you in the. So there was my chance. I had to start, you know, if I wanted to start failing stuff, I could get into the band, but I just didn't have it in me to do it. man. Yeah. I just have it in me to, to, you know, plus, you know. And so anyway, go to Korea, come back from Korea. I'm in Washington state. And then uh, in about May, about mid May or whatever, I get a letter in the mail, mail call uh, from uh, my good friend who would later become my wife, who was working at University mm. of the Arts. And she said, hey, you know, I just thought you should know they have started a master's program uh, for teaching, you know, and I know you would always talk because she had been my best friend. She's like, I know you always talk about getting your teaching degree and whatever, and, you know, it didn't work out and whatever. But, and this might be a chance for you to do that. And I went, oh, that's really cool. So uh, I filled out the card that I was interested in, whatever. And then I get a letter from the head of the department. And he says, hey, listen, we're just starting this thing up. And we really need people who can play instruments to cover our ensembles. So if you can get into the program, you need to apply and everything. But if you get in, it's full scholarship if you just play in our groups. If you just play in the jazz band and mm. play in the orchestra and do all these things for us, that'll be that'll take your tuition up. And I was like, Oh wow. Okay. So I show it to my platoon sergeant. He's like, Oh shit, man, this is a chapter. I'm like, what do you mean? It's a chapter. He goes, this is a once a lifetime uh, time opportunity. Right. And I'm like, I guess so. I mean, maybe it'll be there next year. I don't know. And everyone, he's like, well, if you want to get out early, this is the way to do it. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah. You, he goes, remember that, remember that, that story about the dude in the, the across, across the other side of the post, this PFC, right? He's an E3. He writes a country song and Toby Keith recorded it. All of a sudden, this kid who the army's paying like $22,000 a year is getting royalty checks for $22,000. And he's, he's 19 years old. Wow. And the army's like, we don't want you with $22,000 in an army barracks. We're, we're, we're kicking you. We're, we're, we're very nicely kicking you out. Wow. It's not a dishonorable discharge. It's just a chapter. You a Once in a lifetime mm. opportunity, you go out and do your thing, right? Wow. So yeah, man. So, well, I was gonna say you seem to have like excelled. You seem, or you at least seem to really grasp concepts and learning, learning those concepts easily. Whether it's an instrument, or yeah. it's a career, or it's a foreign language. If you weren't, um, if you weren't a musician and you didn't become a teacher, what do you think you would have done? Uh, it, well, one possibility is I would have been in the service forever. I would have joined at 18 and stayed in for 20 years and I'd already be retired full retired. retirement. Right. Yeah. Um, that's one thing. Um, you know, before I started to get serious about playing music for many, many years, I was in scouting. So up until about 11th grade, when I really got the bug to play, um, I really wanted to work for the forest service. I imagined myself in a smoky bear hat saying, put your fire out you know, hang up your food so the bear doesn't get it. You know what I mean? I really wanted to be out in the woods, you know, doing all that kind of thing. So that could have been a thing. Um, huh. So then I played in the reserve band for um, till the end of my um, contract, which was 99. So when I started at WIS, that was it. one weekend, you know, I, I there were some weekends, bro, where I had a marching band competition on a Saturday and I had to be eight to four at drill and then, you know, jet over to the school in my BDUs and change into my Wissahickon clothes and take the band to a competition. And it was just, wow. At the time, the commander of that band was my assistant director, Mark Engie. You remember Mr. Engie? I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember him. He was mm -hmm. an elementary teacher. He just retired last February. But anyway, he was my commander. But then when we were in marching band, I was his commander. So okay. anyway, um, so all the way to 99, I did that. And uh, January of 99, I signed out. And they were wow. like, oh. 
because he was like, oh, take over the band, you know, take it. I'm like, no, I don't, I want to be done with this. So I had yeah, no man. So, so that was my, so that was the military thing. And, you know, it's, uh, it's helped some, you know, I always make my bed when I get up in the morning, my shoes mm. are lined up. I just don't know how to do it any other way. You know, the next chapter after that was definitely, you know, uh, I got my walking papers from my, my daughter's mother and, you know, they eventually moved back to the area. I happened to mention in band one afternoon that, uh, oh, hey, they're moving back, you know, whatever. And they're kind of looking for a place. And if anybody knows a place and there was this little flute player, I forget her name, but she would often leave um, every once in a while. She would leave a pamphlet from her church on my music stand. She goes, oh, my grandma has a house right down in, in Ambler. And, you know, that she's trying to rent it or maybe sell it. And I'm like, oh, what's the address? And I drive by, it's a nice little house right down, you know, uh, just off Bath Pike, not too far from anything. And uh, so I take a picture and I send it to her and I go, look, this is really close. It's in Wissahickon district, which as you know, is a really, really good district. Cool district and it's yeah. free. Hello, it's free. <laughs> you know, you might have some activity fees when she gets into high school, but essentially just get on the bus and you get right. a really good education, right? And she's like, well, I'll consider it, whatever. No, no, no. She comes down and looks at it and grudgingly says, okay. So thank goodness, you know, so fourth grade on Ellie was in WIS all the way through to her virtual graduation in my, ja in my driveway this year. Um, <laughs> dude, all those years of doing graduation, imagining someday, before I even had a kid, I'm like, someday I might have a kid and they might walk across the stage and I can hand them their diploma. You know, and then she starts at WIS and I'm like, oh my God, someday. And the senior year starts and I'm like, this is the year, this is it. I'm going to kind of step away from the conductor area and hand it to her, whatever. No, <laughs> no, thank you. No, no COVID. Wow. Anyway. Yeah. So she, she excelled. She did a really good job all the way through. Um, she won a couple scholarships at graduation. Uh, she's at Clark University uh, studying political science and gender studies. Wow. And uh, is so far, you know, this is their freshman year. So, so far she's kicking it. I talked to her today and she's like, yeah, I'm doing all right. You know, I don't like my econ class, but I'm doing all right in it. And blah, 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 blah. You know, you know just the college stuff, right? Does she, does so, she play? Uh, well, she did. She played clarinet a little bit. And she played bass a little bit. But in ninth grade, she auditioned for the jazz band as a singer. And so she sang in the two o'clock band and then she sang in the one o'clock band and uh, 11th grade and the two uh, festivals that we went to in uh, when she was in 12th grade before the COVID shutdown, okay. she either won a solo award or got an honorable mention every time. So she's a really good little jazz singer. That's awesome. Um, and I told her when she got up there, I said, you know, just, you know, I don't know what the music department is going to do there, but if you put up a little pull off thing that says singer looking for rhythm section, guess mm -hmm. what? <laughs> they're dudes are going to be calling you like, Oh man, we want to play. Like, you know, you know, tunes. Oh yeah, we do too. You know, and that's she, awesome. she hasn't got around to that, but anyway, man. So that's what it was. I met my wife now, um, on OK Cupid in 2012. Okay. I woke up, uh, January of 2012. And I'm like, look, I've been by myself for years now and mm -hmm. it's not cool. And let's just see what this is about. And we both answered like over 300 questions and that's the trick on that site in particular, the mm -hmm. more questions you answer, right. the more points of data the algorithm has to match you up. And so- Can I just tell you, weeks, on, yeah, on, on the converse, on my side, the more questions I answer, the more it separates me from everyone else because my answers are so, are so whack. <laughs> right, but, but get this, man. When the right person does the same thing, and it's going to be a lock. Like, you <laughs> never know, man. That was the thing, right? I was getting all these like 45% and whatever- I went to coffee with this woman and just had coffee and that was it. And her job was uh, building and selling display uh, setups for like military and cop equipment conventions. And I'm like, I yeah. don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Da, 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 da. I don't even think we have the same politics, man. You know, whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was just like 45%, whatever. And then bam, all of a sudden, here's a 92%. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a number that high. And I wrote back and I said, either there's a mistake or we should probably meet because this is the highest number I've ever seen. She's like, me too. Let's get together. Yeah. Well, we meet on a Thursday night uh, down uh, in Fairmount where she lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, dude, it was just fireworks. And then, of course, within about, I don't know, five minutes, 
she's like, oh, you're the guy from Hoppin' John. I'm like, oh, you're the guy from Hank's Cadillac. Are you the girl from Hank's Cadillac? That's your band? We wow. knew of each other's bands. We had both played uh, in 05 when uh, Katrina, Katrina happened. They had a benefit at um, World Cafe. And she, oh, yeah. her band opened the show and our band closed the show. And because we got there late and closed the show, I never got a program. She had a program. She's like, check this out. And we're both in the program, you know? Um, oh, wow. Yeah. It's they, like meant had, to be. Yeah, man. And, you know, like I kept thinking about as we started to find people that knew both of us, mm -hmm. I kept, I started asking them, why didn't you introduce us? And like, oh, it didn't occur to us, you know, whatever. Anyway. They uh, didn't know you were such a high match. I guess so. Well, well, the, in particular, this one cat, uh, Michael Salzberg, who is also a very interesting individual. He has a PhD in math and has three patents for software, but he's a killer violinist and he's on a Billy Joel album. So like oh, wow. he's he's a really he's on my uh, dissertation committee. He's like, oh, I'd love to help you out with that. Anyway, cool. he plays in a 1920s band that I play in occasionally. Back then I played in it a lot more. It, you know, like 20s transcriptions, you know, they do like uh, uh, Eddie Lang, Joe Venuti tunes and stuff. And he plays the, the Joe Venuti part and Richie plays the Eddie Lang part. And, you know, anyway, so I knew this guy and he's a pretty cool guy. We got along pretty good. Well, he's the fiddle player in her band. So I email him. I go, hey, Mike, uh, I hope all's well, man. I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, but I just met this woman who says you play in her band and she seems like really the cat's pajamas, you know, so just please tell me she's cool and that she's not like a psycho ax murderer or something. Well, unbeknownst to me, she goes in her house and writes to him and says, Hey, uh, Mike, I met this guy and he says he plays with you in Richie's band. And just please tell me he's not an ax murderer. Oh, it really is meant to be. Dude, it was so <laughs> many things like that. So many things like that. So it turns out she's a longtime radio DJ. She was wow. a big star in Connecticut in the 1980s on WHCN. Um, whenever you're a DJ and you're the first one in a geographic area to play a new album, if that album goes gold or platinum, they send you one also. So mm -hmm. she's got about eight in the basement and she hung up the two platinum ones in her office. That's cool. So, so she broke, um, Lenny Kravitz's first album and she broke the Edie Burkell album, the first Edie Burkell wow. album, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, she's a kind of a big deal. Yeah. And then... She worked at XPN, WXPN for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I recognized her name. I'm like, are you the one from XPN? She's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. So she started her own DJ business and now she's had oh. this amazingly successful, you know, 99% of them are weddings. She's at a wedding right now, in fact. Okay. Um, wedding DJ business where she has about seven or eight people that work for her and do, does all these gigs a year. And you know, basically does a two, four hour gigs on the weekends and spend some time on the computer booking the gigs and stuff and makes like so much more bread than me. And when I realized that I was like, Oh, you you're doing it all like, wrong. I, I missed the boat, man. Why am I working so hard? You know, gee, geez, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, she is just absolutely my puzzle piece. I don't know how to explain it any other way. It's, she's, she's just, she's the perfect thing for me. I'm kind of in some ways the perfect thing for her. That's in awesome. uh, 2014, I, um, you know, we were living in Chestnut Hill and I had wanted to get another master's degree in music history for a really, really long time. And she said to me, well, why don't you do it? And I'm like, well, mm. because, you know, I don't really, you know, the money and whatever. And did it. she's like, you know what? I got you. I Let's just, just do it, you know. So I qualified for a sabbatical from Wissahickon. So I took a sabbatical in 1415 and did my first year. And then the second year was harder because I was teaching and going to grad school. But at the end of 16, you know, I had a, um, I had a, a, another master's degree in music history. I'm about four or five classes away from having a third master's in social emotional learning, eh, but I started this doctorate. So that'll be, that'll be the final one. I think. Um, anyway, man, she is just amazing. She has a daughter who's a, an animation and illustration major senior at Cal State Long Beach. Oh, wow. So, okay. So last summer, we went out there and spent a couple of weeks and, you know, Dude, I you showed travel around. like awesome. You're oh, traveling. yeah, man. I love to travel. Dude, my my birthday present for my 50th birthday was a trip of a lifetime. I um, I saved up money the whole year. And then uh, a couple of weeks after my about a month after my birthday, we flew to Memphis mm -hmm. and spent four days in Memphis. We rented a car and drove the Blues Trail down through Mississippi 
all the way to New Orleans and spent four days in New Orleans. And literally she had to drag me to the airport. I was like, that's it. I'm quitting everything. I'm staying here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to play gigs. I'm going to eat good food. You know, I'm going to, it's not going to snow ever, you know? So yeah, that was my birthday present to myself when I turned 50. It was really something. I also had a giant birthday party. I closed off the street and hired a blues band and got a giant roasting pig and tons of beer and food and stuff and left the doors open and the air conditioning on, invited the whole neighborhood and all my friends and had the blues band play. And it That's was awesome. just- That's it a was great a musical fun. vibe. That's Dude, a it vibe. was. Music was is so much about movie. vibes, right? What's that? Music is, is so much about vibes. Yes, yes. Uh, that's what I, that's what I do love. Like I said, you know, mood and and vibes and culture, and I, I equate so much of that to music, um, mm. and especially throughout my life. You know, mu- everything that I listen to is like a memory. It's like you know, uh, for me, music. Uh, uh, each song is like a, a t shirt that someone gave you or a hat that someone gave right. you, and they go, "Hey, what's Connect. that? What's that shirt? Where'd you get that shirt? Where'd you get that?" Hat? You know, every song that I, I remember, I, I kind of remember the era of my life that I heard it or that it meant something to me or. You know, so that's that's very that's very very cool that you can dial that in like that, man. A lot of people it just goes past them, but that's well, very. very cool. I grew up like that too, like in that world where you know, like my dad listened to a lot of music, and um, like you mentioned, like you know, Cat- Catterall Adderley, and like yeah, yeah. these these records, and like I have like all these records of my dad's that are like from the fifties. Like I've got records with Ray Charles from like fifty four, where he's just playing piano; he's not even singing. Right, you, right. You know, I've got like all these, all these different like influences that that came from my dad and music. Um, that it's just that's how I've grown up my whole life. Well, and and again, you know, you, when it's happening to you, you don't think it's anything. You know, that's just how you do. And then you yeah. meet other people who don't have that, and you go, "Ah, oh, wow, your life is not as in colorful as mine has been," or whatever. And you try and help them and try and show them, right? Yeah. I wanted to ask, you know, on, on that note, kind of, where do you see, you know, there's, especially with everything that's going on and hopefully things get better as far as in person and, and um, you know, all around, I know some schools and States are doing things differently, but, you know, overall, assuming things go back to somewhat normal, where do you see like music program and, and music in general, music education? I know that's something that a lot of people fight for because with funding, the arts are often the first things that get cut right. sports, but you know, from your, you've now, it's been 20 years for you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see things. Well, I, I see at least in, in speaking specifically about, you know, our district and the ones around us, mm-hmm. those are pretty well supported and well sourced. Um, and, you know, also a lot of the people that live there have a lot of education. And so it's really unusual for us. It would be really unusual for a school like Wissahickon or Upper Dublin or say Hatboro or PW or wherever like that to lose any of their arts stuff. They might drop a class here or there, you know, whatever, but they're not going to, you know, to lose an actual teacher from a program because a program has shrunk, you know, there, there are, you know, there are ebbs and flows in interest. You know, you have a year where you just don't recruit a lot of people in the elementary school. And then five, six years later, you have a, a year where you only get about 10 or 12 freshmen coming from the middle school. You have other years, you have 25 or 30, mm-hmm. you know. So there is an ebb and flow to it. But where do I see it going? I, I really think, I hate to say this, but I really think things like wind band and wind ensemble despite the fact that there are tons and tons of people that are teaching it in college and there's college programs and you can go to learn how to conduct it and stuff. I feel like in many ways, it's an anachronism. And sadly, I think jazz music, um, despite the fact that it's a national treasure and people think about it that way, the same way, you know, essentially instrumental music in any form that doesn't have vocals in it. the, the, The real tragedy is that that a lot of schools in the younger grades, the middle school in particular, but also elementary school have taken away um, their sort of music appreciation classes, if you with, you know, where they're, they're telling these kids like, look, you know, you, you might think this is stuffy, but you know, Mozart was a badass. check this out. Right. Or whatever, you know, th- to, to have them hear that they don't even accidentally hear it anymore outside of their video games. Right. When you were coming up and even when I was coming up, you know, sometimes TV theme songs were a little jazzy or, you know, uh, movie soundtracks would have, you know, big sweeping string things and whatever. And, you know, the Star Wars kind of stuff that John Williams does, you know, Mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. 
that's mostly not what's happening in these in these soundtracks for these superhero movies that are so popular you know it's a lot of synthesizers and a lot of things like that it's not you know strings and stuff so i think you know the fight is going to become about the culture as much as anything else because you know there's no you know for a kid for a kid like for example um i have this trumpet player in the band right now and he's really hot to get into a drum and bugle corps you know the the super competitive young you know youth drum and bugle course. I don't know if you know about that, but no. that's that's like the NFL for high school marching band. Okay, the seventeen to twenty one junior drum and bugle course. They 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 are very very hard to get into, but once you get in them, you go to clinics over the weekends in the winter, and then as soon as school is out, you go to a camp, and then you spend all summer traveling literally all over the country playing these big competitions with these super complicated. Uh, movements and super complicated shows and it's all kids you know 17 to 21 and when you turn 21 you're out right wow. and this kid is 17 he's trying to get in he's a good player and he might he might just make it um but uh outside of that and outside of kids that really really want to go into that it's it's anachronistic man it's not you know you don't have like regular shoebies on the street going, Oh, I can't wait to go hear this concert band record. You know what I mean? They just don't have, and it isn't because the music isn't good. It's just because they don't know what it is. And and if you don't know what it is and you don't have a guide to say to you, Hey, sit and listen to this with me with an open mind. And if you have any questions, you know, I'll answer them for you. And then they go, Oh, wow, that's pretty neat. That's pretty, you know, let me show you the score. I mean, look at what this oboe part does, you know, whatever yeah. you bring them into it and help them understand what's going on. Then they appreciate it right? Then they appreciate it. The kids that go through their music programs usually grow up to be adults that at least appreciate instrumental music, but the kids that don't, they don't even hear it by accident, right? So I'm a little concerned about that because, you know, I, I think that strong programs like ours and like the ones around us and other places in the area, other places in the country are going to continue, but I do think it's going to become you know, uh, in, in, a, in a similar way to like the highest level of jazz playing is Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra and maybe a couple out in L.A., you know, but they're not playing in concert halls. Usually they're playing in restaurants, you know, that have a nice stage and stuff. You know, it's 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 kind of come out of that, you know, the big band and the, even the small groups and stuff, the jazz clubs. There's only one full time jazz club in Philly. Right now, it's been there. Chris's, it's been there for years, right? There used there's to be time, 30. right? Time's there. Well, time, but time, time only holds like five, six people on stage, right? So, you know, you can't have like a jazz big band, like that anachronistic thing, which is so powerful and so interesting and so cool. And literally the lingua franca of Duke Ellington, greatest American musician, like it's, you have to, you know, you have to go find it, right? Mm. So, and the same thing with the Philadelphia Orchestra. I mean, they built the Kimmel Center, you know? There used to be a coffee shop there before. And I used to play hacky sack in that park that was there. And they built the Kimmel Center as a home for the Philadelphia Orchestra. Right. To my opinion, the greatest orchestra in the world. They're not playing right now. But but honestly, you know, I would go and it would be all these super old people. And you see one or two young people from college. And they're there because, you know, they're taking a music appreciation course at Temple. And they have to go to a concert. You know what I mean? For years, man, I had uh, season tickets to the orchestra, two tickets, right? And I would, in my music history class, I would say, all right, raise your hand if you've never seen the Philadelphia Orchestra. Okay, raise his hand. I'm like, all right, next Tuesday, we're going. What? I'd write a note to their parents. I'd say, look, meet me in front of the Kimmel Center. And, you know, you can pick them up when it's over. Pick them up at 10 o'clock. It's a school night. Yeah, but it's, it's worth mm-hmm. it. Okay. So for years, I would take kids and every single time, I'm telling you, every single time, kids blown away. And sometimes they were like kids who've been thrown into music history, didn't want to take it to start with. And then all of a sudden they hear, you know, some amazing thing like Shostakovich festive overture. I remember this, this super tough kid was like, yeah, I'll go with you. My mom's making me go, you know, the sourpuss goes in. Soon as the brass section came in, his eyebrows popped up and he went, Oh my God. All right. And we walked out and he's like, Oh, can we go again next week? I'm like, yeah, we can go again next week. You know what I mean? Yeah you have to experience it. And so many people don't, so many people don't experience the power of that, that they don't know what they're missing and what's gone. But the anachronistic sort of, you know, uh, character 
of traditional classical music, which by relation is wind ensemble and concert band music. And then also jazz, I hate to say it, but you know, you have to, you have to get off your butt and go out. You're not going to hear it accidentally. And we're already at that place. Yeah. Combine that with the collapse of the music industry in terms of recording sales and stuff. And it's really, really hard for anyone. It was always hard to make a living as a musician. Now it's even harder because the, all the people in the middle who used to be able to, you know, people who aren't at the very top and they aren't at the very bottom, all the people in the middle who could make a living because they had a regional group that was pretty good and had some records and they had a following and it, you know, it allowed them to have a beach house, you know, or whatever, all of those, that all that's gone. Yeah. The people at the very top are still doing it. And the people, you know, that are just doing it for fun are still doing it. But the whole middle, like, I wonder all the kids that graduated in 2020 from music school, you know, all the violinists and all the players, what are they, what are they going to do? What Where do you go to apply going? your craft and keep educating other people who get brought along to those things? Yeah, I felt yeah, a yeah. similar way. You know, I'm, I'm, I love jazz. I love, I love blues and, and R and B, but hip hop for me is, is my primary. Right. Um, and I felt a similar way about hip hop, you know, growing up, there's a lot of people that would go to like nightclubs and you would hear about this when you're 15, 16, 17. Right. But when I finally got to like that 21, 22, 23, where I really felt comfortable um, getting out there and like, going to a place where there's a dance floor and, and having drinks and, yeah, and just yeah, yeah. dancing all night or, or seeing a DJ and those places one by one all started disappearing. And um, a few years ago, you know, I, I was doing a hip hop show and we were talking about, um, you know, music in Philadelphia, where do you go to listen to music? And it's like, you know, there's like three places around here where you could legit, not, not a jukebox. We could right. actually, you know, go and, and see someone spin and, and have one of those like, real experiences. Right, right. Well, I, I can tell you that, that, you know, when I first got out of the service, I had been playing in, I had been playing in this ska funk reggae band that got signed, but I'd also been playing with this band called Scram, which was sort of like a world beat band. Mm. Um, they're very, very, very interesting musicians in that band. One of them was Elliot Levin, of course. I mean, yeah, if you know who Elliot is, mm -hmm. he lives in West Philly. No one knows how old he is or where he lives. He's, he's looked the same since 1990. Nice. And so that's like 30 years ago. And I saw him recently playing on the street down by the Phillies game. I'm like, Elliot, he's like, dude, he looks the same as he did in 1990. It's so freaky. Anyway, wow. he's an avant-garde saxophone player. He was in that group, whatever. Um, that band Scram, oh my God. With Scram, they used to get the best opening gigs ever. We opened for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We opened for Fishbone. We oh, opened wow. We opened for uh, Malutini and the Malatella Queens. We played oh, six. One. We played six shows with No Doubt and Fugazi in Washington D.C. across an entire week, like just day Yo, after I day see after day. Are there recordings you know, of this? All the, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're out. They're online and stuff. They're out there. But anyway, see you was, with Fugazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fug Fugazi was the headliner, right? So it was us, Great. then No Doubt, then Fugazi, just like that. And you should have seen the mix of people to coming out to that gig. That girl singer from No Doubt, by the way, the first time the first time we played with them, oh my God, we're backstage. She's yeah, literally lighting one, what is her name? Gwen, Gwen yes, Stefani. yes, Gwen Stefani. That's Gwen, right. Yeah. I, I always forget her last name. It was Gwen. I just knew her as Gwen. Anyway, yeah, yeah. she's 17 years old in this band. She's lighting one cigarette off the next one. And I'm like, yo, kid, you're going <laughs> to, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. She's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, can't smoke like that. She goes, Oh, you know, I get nervous before I have to sing and whatever. I don't want to sing. I'm like, just maybe, maybe just one, you know? And she's, I don't know. Every time I would see her, I'm like, She's like, Hey, you got a light? I'm like, No, I don't have a light. You know, and I would get on to her about it. And it, it got to the point where when I would see them, they would be coming, getting out of their van. We'd be getting out of our van. And she would go, I know, don't yell at me about it. I'm like, Hey, Gwen, and, hey, man, you know, whatever. And, she did uh, all right for herself. She did, and and there was a bass player in that band also that was really killer. I think she married him at some point. Anyway, yeah. he was a really really good Gavin. player, man, and a really good dude. This was this was nineteen ninety or ninety one, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, when I got out of the service. Scram got this gig at you know where the American Diner is on uh, sixty three. Uh. No, no, no. It's it's it it was what was it called? God, it had a club next door. 
and it's right on Spring Garden Street, like oh. Ninth and Spring Garden. There was a there's oh, a, oh down here. I thought I'm thinking of the one out in Lansdale. <laughs> oh no 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 no. The, the the real one downtown. They had a night uh, where uh, where they had live music with a DJ. And mm. so a couple of the dudes from Scram, you know, what this was years and years later, they're like, hey, we're doing this thing with this DJ. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, what we're doing is, you know, we have, we have drummer, bass player, guitar player, a couple horn players, and we're playing some tunes. And he, he is playing along with us and putting beats in with what we're doing. And then sometimes the drummer will lay out and we will play along with the track that he's playing. And sometimes he'll play something, we'll play along with his track. And they were really trying to, mix live music with a dj which okay. a couple of bands managed to do that back then this would have been 94 right? right the band was called shoulders of giants and i believe the dj was called king brit if that okay. name makes any sense to you mm -hmm. anyway K king brit uh was one of the people that um that amir uh Questlove, um, yeah. was really, you know, learned a lot about DJ stuff from Brit. Like he and Brit were like good friends. And I remember Amir was in a, a couple of times and came up and was like, you guys sound good or whatever. He had the biggest, af oh my God, mm -hmm. huge effort. Anyway, That's this, trademark. Was, this was way back he's, when. He's know? also doing all right for himself. Yes, he is. Anyway, right. that, that whole thing of trying to mix all of that together that was live in a club, you know, that was DJ. Sometimes it was King Brit. Sometimes it was some other guy, but we were trying to mix it together. Eventually what happened was the other guy, not Brit, sometimes Brit, but this other guy would start playing a tune. He'd go, I got this one. You guys take a break. Hmm. And it, that was it. That was the gig. We were broke at the end of the gig, you know, you just take over the whole gig and people were dancing and, you know. Yeah. You get that instant, that instant reaction to see if it works or not. Yeah. 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 It was something, man, but you're right. There's, there's not a lot of places. And, the the splintering of music and the you know here here's a here's an interesting thing i started this a couple years ago um i haven't done it yet in you know virtual this year but towards the beginning of last year i just went around the room in the band and i said what's the last thing that you chose to listen to on your own that you didn't hear by accident that you said hey i want to hear that what was it and dude if you can imagine it was everything from a country song to a mm. video game. There's a lot of video game songs that they find online and listen to again. Right. You know, there were a couple dudes, it was classic rock tunes. There was one girl, it was a Korean pop song, you know, it was just, every, no two were the same and they were all wildly different from each other. The mm. balkanization or the democratization, if you will, of all of that, you can have, find whatever you want. You can listen to whatever you want. You know, you don't accidentally hear things and go, oh, Unless your friend goes, oh, man, you got to hear this. And they share yeah. their little headphones, you know, or they take out their ear pod and give it to each other. Ew. But anyway, I don't know, man. It's we'll see. I, I got to tell you, uh, as a historian, mm -hmm. I have to feel like when records first started being sold around 1920, I'm sure all those musicians went, oh, that's it. We're mm -hmm. done. No one's ever going to hire us again. Right, right, right. Live and music then when, when they started playing records on the radio in the late 1930s or middle 1920s and there were lawsuits, they were like, you can't do this. You know, you can't just play the record on the radio. You know, you have to have a live band in the studio playing. What are you doing? You know, uh, the, there's always going to be musicians. There's always going to be people who like to hear music. What form that takes. I would, you know what, if we knew, guess what? We'd be really rich. <laughs> Well, this has been like an awesome talk. Um, yeah, the, last yeah, right. thing I, the last thing I always do before yeah. I say goodbye is I like to look in the yearbook. Okay. And you actually signed my yearbook. Oh, I love that. All right. What did I say to you? Do you remember? Uh, it was very hip, to be honest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We get to the faculty. I kind of remember, I can kind of like quote it. You said, um, you said like, hey, BC, on the QT, you're you're a really cool guy and then like a best of luck but i thought like wow i said the qt that sounds like very hip <laughs> yeah bc it's on the quiet, it's on the quiet tip <laughs> bc on the qt you are the man it's been good to know you yeah there you go see and, and uh yeah 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 with the ponytail yes with the ponytail right on it that came with the, the music program 
That's right. That was the second time I grew a pony. I had a ponytail when I showed up to basic training. Boy, did they love cutting that thing off. <laughs> anyway. It's Dude, great. it is it is so good to see you and to hear it's you. Good to and, see you. I got to tell you, you know, it, it's very full circle because the day I decided I was going to do this as a podcast, I was going to start doing this. I had run into a classmate um, at the bar earlier in the day. I was with some friends, and it was St. Patty's weekend, right? And um, you know, I, I'd ran into him and and hug each other, and and my friends that I'm with say, "Hey, do you know that guy?" And I go. I, I, I've never actually talked to him in my life, but you know, it's when you run into people from high school that, you know, yeah. Yeah. You, it's all buddy, buddy, but it's like, we never talked. We were never friends. Like I said, kind of the, the thesis of this show later that afternoon, I ran into you at the Phillies game and I went, oh, right. I got to do this now. I'm right. seeing too many people. I have to do this. So it's a nice full circle. You being the very first teacher to actually do this, oh, you know? Oh, right on, right yeah. on. Yeah, so well, like, yeah. You know. And again, man, I, I really love that you have you have kicked ass like I, knew, like I knew you were capable of. I'm glad to see that you have done it. Thanks, man. And also, you know, how nice that you have this experience and skill, this sort of documentarian experience and skill to do something like this and to, and to edit all this together and, and really make it into something that's meaningful. Like a lot of people will be daunted by the technology, but you're like, oh, I do this all the time, you know? So, <laughs> so right? So, yeah, it's very, very cool, man. And what a great talk, man. What a great talk. It's been really so nice much fun. With you. Yes, indeed. And I hope to see you down in the uh, nice street market sometime. Yeah, man. seriously. I'll, I'll give you, uh, I'll email you like my info and, and all that. And, uh, you know, text me, call me, email all me, right. whatever, if you're ever well, going to come and, down and again, here. Man, I, can, I can point you to, uh, to, um, the uh, I have so many stories, by the way, so many stories, but I can point you to my band's page and to my wife's band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put all that. I, yeah, I'll put all that in the in the description and all that. OK, super cool, man. Super That'd be cool. awesome. All right. Well, Mr. Dude, Hook, thank you thank so you much, so man. Much. You can call me Mike, brother. You Mike. Can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother Brad, you can do it. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right. And you are the man. Thank you, brother. See you, baby. See you, man.